three on November 24, 21st, 2021, sorry. Uh, so approval of the agenda. I'm gonna ask if there's anybody got a late item they'd like to add. Hearing none, I'm going to add one. Just an update for uh, the Plan Development Committee about revitalization tax and uh, uh, DCC produce a, that's being talked about. So that was from the finance meeting this morning. Okay. That is item D. E and we'll move F down already. Oh, we we can add it as item D, like in, under section D. Uh, sorry, under five new business, and then we'll add it as E. E is a waterfront wall. Oh, and then our we'll yeah. put it as F, and we'll bump F to F, F to G. Yeah. Why don't you make it? Why don't you make it F and move F down? Do you want to talk about the last or do you want to talk about the second last? Okay, second last then. Okay. Def, and then we'll change the last item to G. Okay, so done. So uh, recommendation at the Planning Development Committee meeting, agenda for November 24, 2021 be approved as amended. Yes, yes, all in favor, yes, good to know. All right, so, uh, Approval of the minutes, recommendation that the minutes of the Planning Development Committee meeting held on November 10th, 2021 be adopted. Yes, 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 all in favor, good to go. Um, development services update, current application, Scott. Yeah, we don't, uh, I think it's almost the same as you saw last time. We have um, one new one at the bottom. Uh, but 541 Thompson Court and 1202 Young Crescent are on the agenda. Uh, some of the old ones that were approved previously have been removed, but uh, yeah, if you have any questions on them, we, we, um, an update might be on 901, 907. We're probably maybe aiming to get that on council for December, but uh, yeah, the rest of them, any other questions? Um, just a comment, if I could. Um, I'd, I'd like to see that we have these remain on here uh but i'd like to see ones that we complete still left but have a completed behind them sure. if possible for future yeah. it just gives Bottom. us and the general public a running mm -hmm. tab on what's going on yeah. okay so any other comments any questions about anything no terry good mm -hmm. okay so new business Housing needs assessment. Uh, this was a hot topic already today. Go ahead, who's gonna handle this one? All right, so we do have our consultant, Jada from City Spaces here to present on the preliminary findings. Um, so just a real quick before we jump into that, where the housing needs assessment fits in our projects. Uh, so this is step one in updating our housing strategy. Uh, the next steps would be that we would review and comment on the preliminary housing needs report um, in preparation of a final draft. It would be presented to, to council to be received and it would be posted on our website. So the, those last two are requirements of the grant funding and province in terms of legislation. Um, and then from there, ideally, we would take that to the housing committee once that's actually formed. So we have set up some advertising to go out in December and January, calling for members to join the housing committee. Okay, so next slide, Steffi. So from here, I'd like to turn it over to Jada. So if Steffi could give her the ability to share her screen. Yeah, done. She can share her screen. Great, thank you. Okay, are you able to see that clearly? Yes? You just stop your share. No. Okay, I'll stop sharing for a minute. Maybe if you stopped sharing, then I will give it a go. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. 
Come in. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Okay, how about now? Are you able to see my screen? Yeah. Wonderful. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Jada Bassi and I'm with City Spaces Consulting and my colleague Angie Rana is with me as well. Um, I am going to be brief in the presentation just being very respectful of your time but I'm happy to answer uh, any questions or dive into additional detail um, that you would like to discuss. So I'm going to provide an overview of the process uh, of undertaking a housing needs report, share with you the housing situation in Sycamus and share uh, some key findings, some evidence and what we heard from the community from our engagement on, on some key themes um, and share with you statements of need, outline next steps and again answer any questions you may have. So the purpose of a housing needs report is to identify populations most challenged to afford housing in the local market, to identify housing gaps and any other housing issues. So by housing gaps, we really mean uh, things like typology, um, single detached forms, apartments, row houses, that kind of thing. But we also mean tenure. So that includes uh, non-market housing, rental housing and home ownership. Um, we do look broadly across the housing continuum, um, and that includes your market housing that's delivered by the private market, so your home ownership and your purpose-built rental, but we're also looking at the non-market supply, so any housing that requires government financial assistance uh, to subsidize the operations to ensure rents are affordable for low-income housing. So we're not looking at just one segment, we're looking broadly at the housing continuum as a full ecosystem. So our process was a fairly straightforward linear uh, approach. We undertook uh, research so that your data, your indicators, um, this is really a, a bit of a laundry list of legislative requirements that the province has. So key indicators that they had an expectation to um, be provided in this report. But we also looked at additional indicators that were not typical or required, but we thought were meaningful uh, for the Sycamus context. And then we undertook engagement, so that included an online survey. Um, we we uh, uh, did some collaboration with the district on some of their other engagement activities to get additional exposure. So for example, we know the zoning bylaw was having an update. So we were able to uh, tie in our process a little bit with that as well, just for efficiency and, and exposure. We facilitated some stakeholder workshops and we were able to do some one-on-one -on -one interviews as well with key informants. For example, we were able to connect with members from the SWATs and uh, First Nation to get their perspective as well. So the, the data, um, as well as the engagement, we utilize that information to inform the housing needs report and that is um, what we're sharing with you today. So in terms of the housing situation, some key themes that surfaced from our point of view was an aging population, a lack of diverse housing forms in Sycamus, limited availability of long-term rental housing, um, housing issues leading to staffing shortages for some employers and businesses in town, and also some emerging patterns of inadequate housing. So some of the indicators that support this include um, this one here, an aging population. This shows the distribution of uh, the number of people by age category. On the left hand, it's the younger cohorts, your zero to 14 or your under 20 year olds. And on the right hand side are your, are your seniors. So the 55 plus, 60 plus, 65 plus. Uh, it's probably no surprise to those in this group that at this time, um, there is an older population in Sycamus. And we expect that that cohort of younger people People are, are going to age every, you know, the five-year increments and we're going to have more people in that age group. That said, we did hear quite a bit from engagement that there are more people moving to Sycamus from outside the region. Um, some of that is, is stirred from, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic. There's been an exodus from, from bigger cities. So we're very curious to see what the data is going to show us um, when the new census is released. But right now there is an aging population and an influx of new people starting to come in. Looking at the types of housing, there is limited diversity. So 67% of homes in Sycamus are single detached, 10% are row homes and 11% are movable uh, dwellings. We heard from the community a desire for um, alternative housing forms that aren't single detached, one, because they're expensive to buy, and also some people are looking for rental options and they're not typically found with single detached. Some homes are, are rented, but not all of them. 
So when I look at communities uh, in similar size to Sycamus, um, there's definitely some room uh, to diversify the types of forms in the community. And same goes with the, the bedroom mix, 36% are three bedrooms uh, and 32% are four bedrooms. We only have 9% as one bedroom units. This is only important when we compare it to who needs housing. And one thing we heard is that there's new people coming to the community. There are also seasonal workers um, that don't require large homes um, and they're looking for those smaller units such as one bedroom. So having a limited number of those makes it very difficult for those renters, particularly the short-term renters. Centers. So 81% of, of uh, people in Sycamus uh, own their homes and 19% are, are uh, renters. Um, but this isn't uh, telling the full story. We heard a lot from stakeholders on the seasonality of home ownership. Uh, for example, one of the concerns we heard is that uh, folks are, they own homes, but they're not living in those homes all year round. Uh, in comparison, there's people looking for places to live, but there's nothing available. So there is a bit of a, an occupancy issue that we have been observing. And the housing issues are leading to staffing shortages, particularly uh, seasonal employees are declining positions and employment opportunities due to the lack of available and affordable units. So some things we've heard is that um, people apply to jobs, they have a, an offer, but as soon as they're looking for a place to live so they can move and take that job, they realize they, there's no, nothing available, so they end up declining. And this has been leading to staffing shortages um, based on what we heard from the business community. And the other thing we've been noticing is some overcrowding. It's not an overwhelming um, a number, but it is something that um, we flagged here that 5% of renters are, are in overcrowded uh, conditions, which means there's not enough bedrooms to accommodate everybody in a household. And we suspect this um, is the case because there's limited rental availability and people are gonna need to find um, additional roommates and, and precarious housing uh, situations in order to find accommodation. And the last indicator here is homes in need of major repair. 7% of uh, owner housing in, are in need of repair. And that means um, homes that have either faulty plumbing or heating or wiring or um, uh, things of that nature. This is higher than the provincial average, which really usually hovers between five and 6%. So Sycamus has homes in need of, of more repair. And this is supported by what we heard from the communities. For example, um, one person said that people are living in uh, rat infested housing and, and heating inappropriately and, and landlords are, are taking advantage of these desperate tenants. So to conclude the statements of need, um, the gaps we identified are, are need for affordable housing, rental housing, special needs housing, particularly accessible housing for persons with disabilities, as well as seniors or who are mobility impaired, um, seniors housing, of course, as well as family housing that are not in the single detached form, so more ground-oriented multi-unit housing. Priority groups are seniors, particularly low-income seniors, young adults, uh, low-income house households, families, and seasonal workers. Seasonal workers is quite unique to um, Sycamus. We don't see that in all communities, but it's certainly one that we identified for this community. So in terms of next steps, we're identifying considerations surrounding the statement of need. And this, this draft is, is nearly complete and we're gonna vet, vet it with staff. But essentially we have some suggestions that the District of Sycamus could explore in terms of initial steps to take action to address housing need. We're planning to present um, the key findings and the consideration to district council in January, hopefully, if we can get on the agenda. And then, um, yeah, the findings from this report, as uh, Sarah had mentioned, is going to be um, uh, submitted to UBCM and, and the province, but it can also be a document used for uh, subsequent planning purposes, land use planning, um, evaluating development applications, and, and that kind of thing. All right, I will stop uh, sharing my screen and I'm here as well as my colleague Angie for any questions you may have. Um, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, I'm going to ask as, as anybody sitting on this have a question. Brian? No. I guess my only question is, is if this informs the planning process is there anything obvious that we should be addressing as part of the rezoning? That I don't know if there's any preliminary findings that we could incorporate now or should or. 
I'll, I'll let Sarah answer that. <laughs> <laughs> I know I hate to kind of say anything because I being at the, the stage we're at, but <laughs> through the chair. <sighs> Um, so yeah, we have done some preliminary soft changes, right? Things yeah. like we've done some preliminary soft changes with the zoning bylaw. Um, the things that are, are kind of typical things that you would see as you know strategies to try to address housing issues. So one is that secondary dwelling units can be detached now on, on single family lots instead of being in the home. It's a bit of a disincentive when it's in the home or part of the home. So they can be detached now. Um, we've added a whole new definition and class of housing that's for employees that's intended to um, help with seasonal workers and, and that's so it's called an employee employee accommodation so there would be multiple employees within this building and that's in the zones that have these kind of seasonal commercial uses so like our tourist commercial uses so you see it in the c6 houseboat the c4 tourist uh, commercial um, and then another strategy was to add multifamily housing in places like uh, our highway commercial zone so we do have a number of applications that are looking for that so one would be best western the other would be the dairy queen which i believe was presented the last pdc right um, so that's that's in there so have a look at that um, and it's always been allowed in town centers, so that's okay. So beyond that, um, once we have this information, we might want to relook at our, our multifamily zone. We only have one, and it's not, it's really wide open, and it's not really trying to target specific housing types. So it's something we could do through our housing committee, get some advice, right, and ideas, and, and go from there. So that would be a, a later amendment to the zoning bylaw that we could do next year. Um. I just about said through the chair, I guess I'm the chair. <laughs> okay, well, that's good. Uh, so I don't know how closely you looked at the DQ one, but that's a single family, two bedroom or three bedroom. I, that's not helping us at all. I'm not as up on the status of that. At initial conversations was have like the three, three units. Have they changed, Steffi? So it's just one. Okay. Yeah, just one upstairs. So that, that doesn't have anything for us. Um, I'm, I'm more concerned about, let's not waste any more time on creating something else. Why don't we just get on with the Airbnb zoning bylaw and get that down to restricted because we got 180 units. Yeah. So Some we'll of those could actually be, if, if they're forced out of the Airbnb, they're going to be rental units that come up or they're going to be for sale. One of the, one of the three is going to happen, but this discussion about Airbnb has gone on for three years now. And our MRDP tax that we have was specific to addressing the Airbnb issue. So, like I said, there's, there's a lot of units that would become available based on however we work that thing out. But I'm hoping that in our later discussion, there's something in our- Yes. Yeah, we'll be able to talk about that later. Um, Jada, did you catch that? Yes, I did. I, I caught it completely. Thank you. Okay. So, so I, I, like I said, the, it was like the earlier discussion today. There's some things that we need to prioritize to get from point because there are people that are hiring people in this community and they're going to the pines or someplace and renting space, hotel rooms so that the people have an accommodation to live in so they can have a job here. And that's just a part of the cost of doing business. So, Thank you for your report. Uh, I guess your next steps will take how long to get back to us? That's one question directed for yourself. Sure, yeah, we're very uh, close. We're going to have a revised um, uh, report over to staff within uh, the next couple of weeks. So staff has provided us with uh, some, some comments and we're in including some adjustments and adding additional data. And we also have a considerations um, section. So these are initial um, considerations worth exploring. So the things that you were mentioning, you know, what, where do we go from here? What are some low hanging fruit that we can take some immediate action? I have about 12 or 13 suggestions. Uh, so they're not commitments, it's not a strategy, but it's just areas that I think are worth exploring based on what we found. Excellent. Good. Terry, go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Jada. We really needed this uh, assessment. And uh, 
Uh, you've laid out just about everything that uh, we realize is, a, is, a, is an issue and problems, uh, a problem in the District of Sycamus. Uh, I think that we need to uh, formulate this in such a manner that it's going to give us some direction and we need to uh, to uh, transfer this over to our economic development corporation as well so that they're aware so that when we have people that are interested in developing housing in Sycamore that uh, uh, they've got a formula in place and a plan in place so yeah I really appreciate what you've done here um, and uh, I say prepared by city spaces I, I, I know you're well schooled on this and and um, and Sycamore has just about every housing need problem that you can imagine and uh, you rec recognize that so we've got lots of challenges in front of us so thank you for what you've done for us thank you. Any other comments? <clears throat> Anybody from anyone? No? All right, well, then let's move on to the develop, development variance permit 21 343 DVP Young Road. Um, who wants to take the lead, Sarah? Yeah, so we do have uh, the agent online if we need to ask some questions. Uh, it's the, the environmental consultant, Michelle. So this application is to replace and remove the dock at 1202 Young Crescent, which is right along that tail end of Main Street, where Main Street Landing is currently. So you can see in the ortho photo there. Are you able to see where Steffi's pointing? Is that good? Yeah. Okay. Uh, you can see the existing um, boathouse that's there and the existing dock configuration. Next slide. So the lease area, which is outlined in black on these images, it's designated within the channel area of the OCP. It's also mapped in the watercourse development permit area. And it's zoned S2 Marine. So the, the use fits the zoning and land use designation. I'm gonna go back a slide. <laughs> okay, yep, next one. Yeah, all right. So the existing development that's there was built under permit originally back in the day. So 1995, 98. So 95 is when the storage building on the upland parcel was constructed and when the main dock structure was constructed. And then in 98 is when the boathouse went in. Next slide. Sorry, the mouse is very touchy. Uh, so this is the current, this is the proposed dock. So the boathouse will be removed. Uh, the new dock will go in and there'll be two berths on the end there. Uh, so in order for them, the property owner to get their lease renewed with Flinro, sorry, Ministry of Forest, Lands, Natural Resource Operations, and it goes on. Uh, they'll need a couple, a few variances actually. So they need a variance right at the very edge of the dock along the channel, the transportation uh, channel there, uh, to about zero meters. Sorry, I think I've got these in the wrong spots. It's no, 0 0.5, I'm not reading this properly. And then all along the bottom side of the dock there, the bottom side of the screen, to zero. It's actually about 0 0.4, but I just made it zero to make it easier. And they'll also need a variance to the size of the lease area. So a lot of the older leases um, fit the previous district lots that were there, which were a much older way of securing the tenure on the water. So they're exactly the same size. They predate our zoning bylaw. Um, so they do need a variance for the size of that. So our bylaw states that it can be no more than 15% or sorry, 50% of the upland parcel size. So this would actually be significantly smaller so they need a variance for that. Next slide. So from here, we would love for some committee feedback to the agent ahead of taking this to council next month. Any comments? 
Deb? Well, just as we were discussing the, the walkway and... <clears throat> so, um, I, 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 I guess there was a... Uh, I, the, bo the boathouse is probably not allowed, uh, but I know that uh, search and rescue was looking for a boathouse, so I'm not sure if that's in any shape at all. That you know, if they got to remove it, they might want to have a discussion with them. And where would it go? I have no idea. Okay. Um, so when you look at these lot lines along this entire frontage here, um, do you want to go back to the ortho? Sorry. The the marina next door is way outside of their lot lines. And when you get to the end, you see that they have a dock that is right on their lot line and then they've got a boat parked outside of it. Now, when we did other marinas, the reason that they have those setbacks is so that when you park your boat, because I'll guarantee you what's gonna happen in their new drawing and even in their existing drawing, they'll be parking their boat into the side where the district has that public access. So I would not agree with any of the setbacks that they're asking for, simply because they're there for a specific reason. You will park your boat along that side. We're talking about here? No, yeah, that, that, that side there. Yeah. You don't want access to here, the public. The reason that you don't allow it is because that if we decided as a district to Sycamus, when we get, if we get a pedestrian bridge or we don't get a pedestrian bridge or whatever happens there, we may decide to increase the size of that five or six slips there. And now you're giving them a permit to the edge and then they're gonna have boats there. And then I guarantee you from being in the Marina dock building business, that's where your issues all start. Those rules are in place to keep the people. It's figured out that that boat could park on the side and he would still be inside of his tent. So, that's a three meter setback from the property line, correct? Is what the existing mm -hmm. one is. So the current zoning is five meters from here. Yeah. The new one, because this is a road end, would be a six meter. Okay. So, um, so I, and I, so I can point out a few things to consider. So A, so the big issue is people starting to use this side to dock boats. What if a railing or something like that was installed to prevent people that like they can't actually get onto the dock? There's that. The other thing to point out is that this is exactly the same location as the current dock. And then this is pretty steep back here. This is all built up. And this is their current access. So in terms of disturbance, in order for them to change this, we're talking about a lot of disturbance upland, which would be a, a whole riparian areas regulation thing. I'm not, I'm not sure how much the province would support moving existing infrastructure that's already in place. If this is all paved, and it's railings and the development permit here required like some really beautiful lighting, but I think it's part of the, the, the walkway. So there is a statutory right of way right here for the walkway in future, but there is some infrastructure already put in like the really nice lights like we have on the street. Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> The question, Steffi, could you go to the the current dock and the chair, Mr. Chair, could you again and explain to me what what your concerns are with the new configuration? So the reason they have to do do something with the dock is because it's grounding out. So their tenures come up for renewal, so they have to meet what the current rules are. Right. All right. So they are now being forced to meet what the current rules are. Mm -hmm. And a lot of those people got a five-year extension. Riverside got one, the rest of them got one. They actually had to put piles underneath their piers to hold the docks up. That's what Waterways got, that's what this got, that's what they all got. Now, in the design of what they do, the setbacks are there for a specific reason. Those setbacks were are they're not they're not so much our setbacks, they're front counter setbacks. So that whatever you want to park on that dock is within your tenure, not on somebody else's tenure. That's why they're there. So you're concerned that people are gonna park on the south side of that dock. Mm -hmm. He may himself. Right. And and because it's there, just go to three boys and ask them. 
that's a public boat launch and everybody uses three boys dock to tie the boat up to until they get out in the water. Okay. So that is an issue. And if the district of Sycamus decides that they want to do a dock and I want to build mine to the five meter setback as the district of Sycamus, when I go to get my boat in and out of the slips, however we can pick them, I might be constrained by that dock being in the way. Now I'm going to ask him to move it, but we've already permitted it. So I'm against it. And as far as his structure from shore, I put in lots of docks. He can put in his pier, his ramp angled if he wants to use the same location. It's going to get changed when and if we ever do. They've already dedicated the walkway. And when the rest of the people like Jay, uh, the Marina next door, Carol already said, yes, they would be in favor of having the walkway put in if we could just get a consensus on the seawall. Uh, we didn't get the funding for it, but you know, most of the major marinas, Papa's, Twin Anchors, the old, uh, where they used to be, they've all consented that if we wanted to actually build it, we could go ahead and they'd, get, they'd dedicate the land to do it. So I don't think that the location of where their pier is going to be is going to make that much difference. But I do know that like the lot lines next to the marina, they've got, we just went through this with the property to the south that we're making them take out three slips because they're over their lot line. And, and now we're going to try to adjust this. Sorry, go ahead. I just have a question for you. Um, so they are trying to reuse some of the piers. And I know that minimizes the disturbance to the bottom as far as the province is required. It's concerned, right? So these ones. Is there any issue with it being up from your experience? Or does it, does it need to be there because of the way the currents? Well, if they if they did that, that's fine. But to, to be right to their property line and constrain mm -hmm. us if we decided to do something, I would and and to the outside, right? 0 0.5? No, because you could just go down and look at the picture. There's a boat parked on the outside of their dock. And these applications are done. Do you look at the Twin Anchors Marina? That lot line that they have on there is designed that all your parking is supposed to be within your marina. You're not supposed to be parking on the outside of it. In the channel, we are constricted that waterway. The Nav Waters has a specific line. And if we don't fix some of the issues in there, this silting issue that's filling it in and making it that they're going out there is just going to get worse, not better. Go ahead. Uh, so that was my, my next question for you. Um, would there be support for a variance in within their lease further into the channel where the silting issue is making it necessary for it to be that far out? I, 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 if you have the ortho on here to do with what the Nav Waters channel is supposed to be, they're probably like everybody else right to the line. Yeah, in terms of navigable. Okay. You need to have something what that line is. And there's a definite map with that Nav Waters channel in there. And and I know further down at Twin Anchors, they're right to it, right, right to the line. A couple on the other side, they're right to the line on it on the on the railroad side of the channel. So I don't remember off the top of my head exactly how close it is, but we do have a map that actually has that For the channel. water channel laid in there. It's 70 feet or 80 feet wide, but there is a map that shows exactly where it's supposed to be. See if I can dig it up. So if they wanted to come further out and they're not in that half channel, but that nav channel, their lot is supposed to be far enough back that if they park the boat out on that outside edge, it's not in that nav channel. It's in their lease area and not in the channel. Okay. Okay. Do you have any questions for the agent? They are an environmental professional. Right. So they're trying to leave the existing piles there. I'm, um, I imagine they're trying to reduce um, the impact within the water as much as possible. Existing piles, wood or steel? Good question. There's Michelle. Yep, Michelle Hill. Hi, thank you for the question. 
Um, I believe they're a combination of steel and wood. I think there's a few uh, wood ones that are going to be replaced and um, some steel ones that would be reused. Uh, so um, then by what you're just saying, they plan on relocating the piles anyway, all of them. Uh, not all the piles. Um, I believe at shore there's going to be two new piles and there's five existing piles on the north side that would be remaining and three new piles on the finger fingers. So you're, you're, you're going to be applying for lake bed disturbance within your tenure. Sorry, I didn't understand the question. So you're, you're, you will be in your permitting, you're, you're going to have a, a portion in there for lake bed disturbance. And as, as my memory serves me correct, you're talking about uh, each pile is worth one tree. That's about the environmental offset on it. If, if you had to do compensation. Yeah. Well, we wouldn't be necessarily doing compensation. Um, on this one specifically, but um, yeah, we would be proposing to disturb um, the lake bottom. Typically right. not too much using a vibro and steel, steel piles. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So the, they're using the same system that I used to use. And so that's not considered that bad of a disturbance. So mm -hmm. I, I, I would, like I said, I can't tell you what the district plans on doing at some time in the future, mm -hmm. but if you look at that app and how much area we have there, we could add a lot more accommodations for public boat use to access our community. And so I think it's imperative that we follow what the rules are and make sure that if the district decides to expand public boat access to downtown, that we have the room to do it. We don't constrain ourselves by allowing people to come right to their property lines. Go ahead, Brian. So what's the setback right now? Five meters. Five meters. The new setback will be six. So that would affect this particular. So if the uh, is there a is there a set number, 1.5 or two meters that would allow for a boat that it could be varied from the five or six meter setback to so that a boat could sit on that side of the dock. So you, you would need three meters would be the minimum. Yeah. I just think that that may be more reasonable. Right now they they have the dock sitting right on the right on the property line. It's in the it's going it's in the set they want to go for the same place they're at now. Um, Sarah. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So if they if it was if it was very to three meters instead of six meters, then at least you can park the boat there and it's maybe a little more reasonable. Again, I, I it's not my decision, but I'm just stating a fact that when we built marinas like the legacy and the rest of them, the, the setbacks that we had to have for getting in and out of them was based on the neighboring properties that they, and I mean, TP never did get a marina, but it was based on the, if they got a marina, how far off of that imaginary proper line did we have to be? And so every single person has the right to ingress and egress from the water to land. That's, that's it, 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 the Romans came up with that idea at the beginning of time. Everybody has the right to get in a lot of water to land because that was the way of movement. Most most countries have adopted it. So if you if you keep doing like what they did and what the marina next door did right to the property line. So if they came in and said that they wanted to rebuild that marina, I would say the same thing to them. They have to be in the zero part. So it's it's just doesn't make sense to have it. it. You end up with the moose mulligans where you got a fence up there between one guy's dock and port side dock. Like that's what you end up with. And there's no it, it constricted both of those marinas. So 
if this this is a residential, and I, I didn't know that on residential we were allowing two or three births. I thought residential was restricted to one. Yeah, this one's a little different. So the upland property is a commercial zoned property and it has had businesses in that building off and on, okay. um, though seems principally to be used to store personal equipment. So yeah, it's sort of an, an odd property. And just to continue this a little bit, when we looked at doing the boat launch at Capel, when we redid the boat launch to put in an actual public dock, we had to actually buy part of, of three boards. So we actually had a discussion with them about building a dock and have it as split use with a fence up the middle of it so that with District of Sycamus actually had a dock that was usable at that boat launch. So that's, that's all I'm saying is, is you, we keep crowding these side by side, especially because the middle portion is public. We need to ensure that we are gonna have access in and out of there without bumping off the side of somebody's boat. Go ahead, Scott. Maybe a, a question for Michelle. Um, you know, is there an opportunity to, to move this dock? Have, have the owners been made aware that, you know, they may have to move it or how's that discussion gone? Um, I think this one's a bit of a unique situation. So it's currently a lease. So if um, we are not able to obtain the variances and be able to renew the lease, it would turn into a license of occupation. And yes, in that instance, it would be a full rebuild of the dock itself. There's conditions in the modification agreement that the province has asked for. One was the removal of the boathouse and um, to make sure it's not grounding anymore. Does that answer your question? Well, I guess have the owners considered, yeah, going to that license of occupation, knowing that they will have to rebuild the dock? Uh, maybe Michael, um, can answer that question. He's online right now. Okay. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. I'm sorry, you were breaking up, so I didn't quite understand the question. Well, I guess my question was, you know, what, what is your opinion or how do you feel about having to, to build the dock within the, the required setbacks? Oh, well, we were hoping to uh, take advantage of the, the current situation with the piles where they are and not have to incur additional costs for moving all of that stuff and um, being able to have those slips with the full advantage of, because uh, it's kind of a narrow lot so every time you move it over five meters and five meters from the marina side, that leaves a pretty uh, small area to operate within of moving boats in and out of the slips. So it was, we were hoping to be able to take advantage of keeping it where it is now. I'm not sure if that answers your question or not. Uh, I, I think it does. And do you understand the, the chair of the committee's concern that, yeah, if, if you go to your property line, then that affects the next, the next property to the south and, and their ability to get to their dock, kind of the same way that you're, you'd be affected by the marina to the north? Yeah, yeah, I do understand that. And uh, I guess, you know, like our problem is compounded by the marina on the uh, west, is it, no, sorry, the north side. Um, they're right on the property line. So we're buttoned up against their stuff. Um, it, 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 it's, it's compounding the problem. And, and that's why I say what I'm saying is, is if we keep doing it, it's just, it, it, it just comes all the way down. And the, and the one that will suffer the most in the end will be the district of Sycamores because we're the one that gave up the most space on both sides because the other guys are doing the same thing. So um, I don't know. Uh, 
there was a suggestion by a member to do three meters, which is a compromise. Um, understand because I went up there and had a look at it because I don't know, I don't see in my package the, that one that had the measurements on it from the property lines. But it appears that you're putting in a, a seven meter uh, boat slip finger and you're you're trying to make them square, which only gives you five meters behind. And if we move you five meters, then basically your your boat slip finger is going to be up against your property line on the other side, which is where their dock is. Is that correct? That's that's the way I see it as well. Yeah, but you built a nice big platform there in front of the boats, so it may be. You know, your, your, your reasoning that you had the angled fingers previously was, thanks. There, yeah, it doesn't show the property line one, does it? Yeah. It, there, it didn't show the distance of the property line this way. So, um, My, my personal opinion is, is not to go to the zero. I could, I could live with three, but like I said, I don't want to see the district being constrained uh, in some future thing that we would like to do there for public access to our community. Yeah, that makes sense. So, um, if you're asking for, you're, you're asking us for a, to review the variance for dock upgrades associated, but you're not asking us for an opinion on this, really? Not at this point. Uh, we weren't sure if we were gonna have all the variances required in time to, for today. Um, we are, we did get that info. And we have sent out notifications today. So we'll bring it back December 8th to the PDC the PDC could provide recommendation for the council meeting later the same day. Sorry. I got a napkin in my hand that has the remains of my muffin from earlier. <laughs> and now it's everywhere. Anyway, I, I, I hope the proponent understands that um, these, these lines that are suggested are the reason that if you give one person that, it just snowballs down. And I'm assuming that the marina next door at some point is going to have to do the same thing when their tenure expires. And I'm hopeful at that time, I don't know whether I'll be on council or this planning committee will exist, but that they actually follow the rules because it's imperative. If they had set back their five meters, then his wouldn't have been an issue because he would have that open space that he could get in and out of his width. But because that's not what was done, it was put right to the property line, that that opportunity is gone until they have to be. Any other comments on that? So uh, just for clarification, are you suggesting uh, that we uh, reconfigure our application uh, with the intent of a three meter setback application? That is what I'm suggesting. I don't know if I got any support from the rest of them. I'm getting nods. So yes, that seems to be the planning committee suggestion that you reconfigure that all sides have a three meter setback on them. Okay, well, we thank you for your consideration and uh, uh, we, we'll be figuring out what we're gonna do from here. Thanks again for everything. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, it's a bad place to be in that that's how I made my living, so. Still coming to tonight's council meeting, Sarah? No. I just was reading it, I don't see it on here, so. No, it'll okay. be December. Okay, yeah, yeah thanks. Okay, so Thompson Court, Elvin Variance Permit 
353 DVP Thompson Court. Uh, 531 specifically Thompson Court, Sarah. Thank you. That is correct. So here we are, 531 Thompson Court. This one is the cell ground of the cul-de-sac. So this, this one here, 521, 511, this is where the Walmart trucking yard is being developed. So that's moving along. This one, just to the north, that's where Alhead Garage is going. It's giving us some context here. And then this is a country residential property with mostly right up along here. Next slide, Steffi. So this property is designated general industrial and is appropriately zoned I-1A, which is a light industrial zone. Uh, it's also in the development permit area for industrial activities, and that applies mostly to forming character of the buildings and the site, as well as uh, traffic flow within the site. Uh, the I-1A zoning does support storage as a permitted use, as this will be a storage building. It does exclude houseboats, but a permitted storage use. This is the proposed building. They are asking for variance for the fencing along the cul-de-sac. The zoning bylaw requires that to be a lot shorter. So 1.2 meters. So they're actually asking for about 1.8. Uh, Alhead Garage and Walmart were varied to 2.4. So just to keep it consistent. That would be the variance that we proposed. So in terms of, I've got a little bit of landscaping detailing here for you. So this is the Walmart yard. They will have cedar hedging all along this fence line. This is the back corner of the Walmart yard, just so you can see. Next slide. And then the rear lot line, which abuts that country residential parcel at the back. They're proposing to retain two meters deep of the existing vegetation along there. We can pop back to the ortho photo for you Existing vegetation comes out to around here. It's about nine meters deep. So they may need to back plant some of this potentially. The draft permit, which should be in the package, uh, it does include some language for the fencing, which would be black chain link, to include some privacy screening in it to help with, you know, the vegetation is thin. They're also proposing to do turf in the front of the yard set back here uh, with some lower line shrubs. So our zoning by that again restricts them to about 0.9 of a meter in height, which is just under a meter. So this kind of a height. Next slide. We did refer this internally, so we do have some comments. Um, building inspector, they'll need a, 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 an engineer, professional engineer for the structure. So this is a prefabricated building. Um, and they'll also need geotech for soil bearing and drainage. And then as far from engineering, all drainage has to be managed on site. So the plan does include an infiltration chamber on the site plan. Next slide. And looking forward to committee feedback. This again would go to the December 8th meetings. Well, that's right. Uh, yeah, I think the, uh, as far as the screening onto that, um, that country uh, residential parcel, that's, I think that's more than reasonable to have that, that two meter buffer and, and the, uh, are they, are they required to have the turf on the front? There was that something that they had uh, designed in there or it seems it seems like an industrial area like that it's if that zero scaping would make a lot of sense that's totally their their thing i'm just wondering if that was something that was that was required i just you know in that kind of a in that kind of a zone it just just seems like you know excuse me the maintenance of that that kind of thing that's kind of gets these things like did a little bit and I just don't know how important it is, but yeah. I, you know, I like grass and trees. <laughs> yeah. 
It's uh, yeah, I, I I'm in support of it. I think it's a, it's a great project. That that'd be my only comments about the the screening in the back in the back. Though that's that's more than reasonable, I think. Uh, through the chair. So yeah, that that was just in line with the zoning, but the current zoning bylaw it asks for grass. So in our new zoning bylaw, it's not specific in terms of it has to be grass. So it would allow for something like zero escaping if someone wanted to do that. Um, this is just what the the applicant proposed. Was for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So sorry, just to clarify, then we think he's put grass in because that's what the zoning said, and so as opposed to talking about the other option. I'm just thinking, for instance, this last summer, I know I was talking to Daryl regularly about how maxed out our water system was, you know, like with it being hot and everything. And it's like, when places don't need grass, I don't think we should be putting grass in. So we're talking about um, rock. Yeah, well, or, you know, a few cactus, I don't you know. <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> But it is her at the end actually. I'm sorry. Uh, the agent Herb is on the line, and it sounds like he'd like to contribute when when the chair gives him the floor. Yeah, go ahead, Terry. Then yeah, okay. Well, I uh, I just looking at this, and it's in the industrial area. And, and uh, what is the main intention for this particular building? Is it uh, for storage, or is or are they going to have some sort of industrial use or commercial use to the, uh, the actual operation, you know, and through the we, chair yeah. uh, at this point, all, all that the agent was able to share with us is that it's for storage. Okay. This is. Um, and who, who is online? My we name is Herb, I'm um, Shield Built. We are the general contractor for the building. Okay, you have some comments? You need to speak up a little bit because you're hard to understand. Okay. I was just following up on the grass. It was kind of in the DP. And so I put it on there. I would prefer actually to do the zero scaping. We would prefer you did that too. Great. Okay. So my next, my question is, is that what is the side fence height? It's six feet all the way around. Security fencing, black chain link security fencing. And 2.4 at the front is six feet? It's actually 1.8. So that can be changed to 1.8 if you prefer. So it, why are they going 2.4 in the front and, and 1.8 on the side? It'll be the actual fence will be 1.8 all the way around. Staff made it 2.4 because that's the variance that was issued for the other two properties, just to be consistent. So when we did this once before about buildings and setbacks over on the hemlocks, we just agreed to make a variance for the entire area. Yeah. Why don't we the last one at this point? <laughs> this is the last lot. <laughs> the district's got a lot too. We might want a variance for our own. So, you know, there's still three lots left over. Yeah, we won't need to. We built that into the zoning bylaw for industrial properties. Fencing can be higher right. for security fencing. So, yes. Yeah, so, uh, we're going to 2.4, but they're only building this. They're building a similar size fence as they were stuck. Uh, can you bring the ortho up, please, of the back of the property? So you say that those trees back there, can you zoom in on that at all? Those those trees are actually nine meters wide from the property line. Yeah, yeah as the deepest. I mean, two meters is like here. Okay. No? So uh, if their property line is right on the other side, it looks like there's no trees there. They plan on leaving those trees, putting a fence on the property line, and then taking out some trees on the other side. So they don't actually have to put in any trees on that side of the property. I mean, where there's where there won't be any. I'm, well, they're I not taking them. out all the trees. You said they were leaving some of those. Yeah, so they would take them out up to two meters, and then within that two meter area, if there's anything missing, you'd have to back plant. But uh, this the screening and the fencing would be because these may be a little sparse lower down, right? Because they've been growing in a clump. 
So they are like at this level, there may not be a lot of screening. Because I know that when that property was developed, there's a berm. Oh no, that berm's further back, way further back. Sorry, forget about it. But the berm is onto the that, that other property line back there. So no, that's irrelevant. Um, yeah, so I don't other than I don't see any they're not gonna have any residential in this at all because that our zoning bylaws are allowed to have residents in the the floor plan just shows like a like a common area, like a lunchroom. Okay. And there's a storage, uh, like a small closet, and a washroom. Okay. Any other comments? Has Go ahead, Brian. It hasn't it, it hasn't been sent out for uh, the neighbors' comments. So uh, yeah. That would be part of the notification. So yeah. yeah, we did send that out today. Oh, just today. Yeah. Okay. For the December eighth meeting. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks to Herb. Thank you. Right. So, okay, so Pony Road. And, uh, Malcolm's in the crowd here, uh, but I, we had a brief discussion. Scott, did you address anything or do you want to have? Malcolm address say his concerns with his. Yeah, I I haven't. Uh, I did talk to Councillor Bushel, and he kind of brought me up to speed on uh, an idea that you're looking for some feedback on um, possible subdivision. But yeah, I think it's it's really for your opportunity now to to present uh, what you'd like to. Okay, thanks. Um, so I'm one of the three owners of the properties at Sapony Road. Yeah. Uh, the property has been operating under an undivided interest for more than 100 years. And uh, we, the owners, uh, well, would like to get a separate title uh, for estate planning and other, other uh, things moving forward. We're thinking of uh, dividing that uh, property into five different lots. Uh, there's basically three residents on it now. Uh, so that would represent the three. There's a trailer spot and then another spot at the end where it joins the pony road. We'd like to make it into five lots. We'll be moving our laneway um, there. So one of the concerns of the group is that there is a uh, waterfront walkway proposed within the district that runs all the way from here all the way down to, uh, to two mile, I believe. And uh, we're concerned about that walkway. And we are asking to begin with, if we apply for subdivision, would it be a uh, palatable for the district to uh, give us a variance on that walkway. If the other part of that question is, if we go to Strata, does it trigger the same the same walkway? And if neither one of those work, uh, we really don't want to entertain anything that'll the walkway that'll trigger the walkway. Then we may have to go to another undivided interest, get a better agreement. And, uh, and go from there. So we're looking for some advice from the district prior to application, just to save save some uh, time and effort. Okay. So my understanding is, and again, this is from Councillor Bushel, um, and he's not here. So he called me yesterday to have a. He's on Zoom. Yeah. Is he on? I, I saw his name. Are you on board? You bet. Go ahead. Oh well. <laughs> why do Why do you not speak to your discussion that you had with the current landowner, which is the vendor take back on the property next door? I think yeah. they need to hear that. Okay, I did uh, talk to uh, Malcolm about it, and I uh, forwarded the uh, realtor's uh, name, and uh, hopefully they've been able to contact each other and, and talk about it. But it's just something that maybe they get together uh, as uh, property owners uh, that utilize that same road and maybe come to some agreement that uh, maybe they take over the road or Rumson does the uh, blasting on that road the same time they blast the property and and uh, bring it down to a level that's acceptable and uh, to both parties. And uh, and then we work out a deal with the district on and on giving up that road or however that works. But that's basically Gord, where, Gord, where could, we- could you, could you speak up quite a bit? Yeah. Okay, okay. sorry, can you hear me now? I could, I could repeat. We're gonna try to turn it up at our end. 
I, I'm as loud as I can go. Well, I, I can basically repeat what he said. B basically, uh, he's given the contact information for the owners of the rock garden to Malcolm. Because one of the issues is this is a pony road and how they plan on doing it. There's a discussion that they've had this property sold a couple of times, but uh, these guys apparently who's looked at it had cash to pay for it, but the, uh, they couldn't get any financing from anybody. So the people that ended up owning it because they financed the operation to start with are going to develop it themselves. And so that road and the blasted out part is a discussion, but that's a discussion that would have to be had between you and them to come to some sort of term about what that road or access might be. And maybe it is that that little piece of your property that's a pony road comes into becomes a part of some access point. I have no idea. That's, that is entirely up to you. Then the district would have to get involved on the idea of whether we give away the road or sell the road or whatever, because I'm not sure who was responsible for allowing them to blast into the side of that to start with. All right. So there's a, this is a, one of them other pieces of property that has a whole bunch of issues going on with it. And the district was somewhat involved in it. So as far as the waterfront, I can't tell you about that. I'm not sure if staff had enough time to investigate if they do a strata, does that invoke the walkway? Subdivision will for sure, but the strata, stratifying the lot, will that uh, invoke that walkway? Right. So it, it's the walkway is only required for commercial development. So if they were looking to do a residential development, they wouldn't be required to provide the walkway. So it's in the it's in the commercial development permit area that requires the walkway. Any subdivision though is going to trigger the requirement for parkland. So you'd have to give up five percent of land or the value of the land for parkland, um, and and it's up to the district to determine if they would like land or cash. So I see an opportunity with Zaponi Road is getting an access to the water at that point, a public access to the water at that point. But um, yeah, ultimately you'd be 5%, whether it be cash or land, but the walkway is not is only a requirement for commercial development. So no walkway, but 5% parkland. parkland. Right. By way of cash or land. Cash equal to the value of that amount of property. Right. 5% of the property. Right. So the property's worth a million dollars, 5%. Okay, so that answers the question. And uh, my question about the subdivision strata undivided interest, I think I'm clear on that. Uh, this pony road was actually the second part of my question. And uh, I, I put a call in to the realtor, two calls actually, and haven't had a call back. Uh, but I'm a little bit confused in that it would be myself and the owner next door. Um, making a deal on a public road. Um, no, that's not what I said, Malcolm. What I said was is that you talk to that developer about what it is their intent is, because what I heard from Gord was they're planning on building 24 units on there. Right. How are they going to access the 24 units? We haven't seen it yet as, as a council. So. If you have the conversation with them about how they plan on accessing the property, that maybe there's a way to access your property. Maybe Saponi Road is not a requirement. I don't know. And as far as my comment on the idea of us having access to the waterfront, that's about a 40 foot cliff at the end of it. it it's a useless piece to have access to the water down the end of Saponi Road for us. Uh, that's my personal opinion. That's not a council's. Um, and if what you're saying is correct, that only commercial properties, so all those residential properties along the frontage between White Pines and TP, if they just build a big house on there and come in for a permit, they're, they're not going to have to donate land, right? Correct. The only thing that happens is, is they lose that water lot that they have on their title. 
and and that would only that would only be if they, they were subdivided. Okay. All right. So there is a problem. that answers a couple. No, to transfer. Speak up, please. Sorry, through the chair. <laughs> I was sort of muttering at Scott. Uh, I have encountered applications where through the subdivision process, they do work with front counter to transfer their water lot along with up to the new title. And I was under the impression that that's what was always supposed to happen. If they came in and wanted to build a bigger house like the guy on Pope Road, he should have lost that water lot that he had. That should have been back to the crown because it's never going to be dry land again. And, oh, I see and, and, and I was under the impression that that's what they were doing when you came in for a building permit. And to get your building permit, you had to give up that lot you have out into the water. And so whether that's fact or fiction, I don't know. But having heard this now, our ability to actually extend this trail all really limited is a viewpoint. So I'd like to make a suggestion. I don't know whether it's palatable to Malcolm or to this, if it's if it's a trade. When we looked at this whole trail thing, the waterfront from Capel to Finlayson was uh, fairly easy to put a walkway in because it's mostly commercial. And everybody gave up the land. Now you get south of Capel, the property owner there can't remember his name. Don, Don, he's a nice guy. He offered to put in a seawall. He paid for it through his side up our boat lodge. But the guys next door, they don't plan on giving up squat. So then you got uh, Bishop Mocha, they're not going to give up squat. So I really don't see that trail in any near distant future happening. So the reasonable thing to do is have that trail and, and, and have funding acquired, if you got to give up parkland, create a trail that goes from Capel across. And then because of that highway right there, when you get to uh, the properties next door there, you got uh, Bonavista, Vista, it comes right up to the highway. That highway to walk on it is like, you're gonna, you're taking your life in your hands. So our only realistic method to link the community by a trail is over the top of that hill, like from Bayview across and down the dump road, basically to get over there because you're just gonna kill somebody on that corner. So if we have development that happens here and we have people that have to dedicate to parkland, maybe it's better that they dedicate cash because it is up to 5% towards that trail that would link the community together because somehow or another we need to build that. And right now, the only way realistically is up Gord Bushels Road. That, that's the realistic, easiest way to get over the top of that. So, um, Upper stone? but you understand that you're going to, you do a subdivision, you're going to have to dedicate the parkland. Strata, would that do the same thing? Yeah. So if you stratify a parkland, Subdivision would trigger the pathway, but strata wouldn't. Is that what you're saying? Oh. No, neither would. Right. On a single family. Right. All right. I'm sorry, I'm having trouble hearing, so I just want to make sure I understand. Um, and then as far as uh, the road goes, it's, um, I understand that, that you'd like to wait until the development is done, but that rock pit there has been there for about five years. And um, I know a lot of people have taken a, a lot of people have taken a run at it. And uh, there just hasn't been any bites. We've heard uh, for a long time now that, that there was different people. Uh, in fact, I have two personal friends that looked at it. Um, so are we going to wait no matter what for the development? Uh, because we have, a, we have a, an issue with access, uh, winter access. Last year, we spent $4,000 just us on, uh, on uh, grading and uh, sanding that road in order to get down there. I'm concerned about the sloughing and the structural stability, instability of that road. Um, that 10, it's already 10 meters over excavated and the remaining 10 meters of Zaponi Road is starting to slough off. And I, and I think you saw that uh, Jeff, when you were there with Gord. So my concern is that if we're gonna wait another few more years, then you know, the liability may, uh, there may be some liability there for the district. So if I might, uh, 
I, I can't say that this is, but Gord has had a conversation with the current owner, which was the finance company, which is out of Ontario, but they have a group out of Kelowna that's involved with them and they want to do something with it because they, exactly as you said, they've tried to unload that piece of property three or four times and they've had it. But when the people have the, they actually had total cash to buy it and they went to get financing to do the development. No, yeah. flat, no, they could, nobody would touch it. It's hard to get cash now. For so the, the actual owner that we took it back to foreclosure plans on development of it. And that, that was a conversation that Gord has had with them. Okay. And he's given you the number to have the conversation. It's better that you have the conversation and find out what their overall plan is so that you can secure access. And then it's up to the district to decide what we want to do with the road. But we don't, we haven't seen what they want to do. So we have no idea. I, yeah. I, I wouldn't vote on, you know, whatever, because I haven't, there's no plan in front of us. I just have what Gord has said, and it was suggested for your sake, for you to move ahead with what you want. Okay, I'll pursue, I'm sorry, I'll pursue that. In the meantime, if we were to put in a subdivision for the lots, can we deal with that on a separate issue? Yeah. I don't That's a different issue, right? Well, I, you know, if, if you came in and you applied for a subdivision, you know, what we, what our subdivision development servicing bylaw says, you, you have to provide like a, a road built to the municipal standard to your property. So you'd have to find a, a, a public road to get to your property. So no is the answer. Well, you essentially you'd have to build the pony road to a public standard. Yeah. Okay, well, we don't want to do that anyway because uh, we want to turn it into a lane. So we need to resolve this the pony road issue first. And your neighboring property. Best you have because the, the district doesn't have any interest in it. Okay. So if, if you find out what the developer wants to do and then the developer puts together a plan and comes in and talks with the planning department or, or this committee and the, the council can make a decision about how we're gonna deal with that road. I'm not trying to say that, and I'm not suggesting for a minute that the district has any obligation one way or the other, but the district in my personal opinion failed to ensure that when they were dynamiting that road out, that they they stayed on their own side of the fence and didn't, didn't take 50% of it for, for their development. So, and I have no idea who the person was that was standing there because that's quite a few more years than five years ago. It's a big problem. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Appreciate uh, your time. Yeah. Any other comments? Well, I mean, that's part of the subdivision process is, you know, you pay, I think it's a thousand dollars for your subdivision fee. You put a, your proposal forward. We have a really good look at it with our planning and engineering department. You get a laundry list of everything you're going to have to do. It's, it's a contract says you do this, you get your subdivision, you know, it might be worth spending the hundred or thousand dollars for the application to get, to get that document back that you can then make your decisions on. If you plan on doing it, Malcolm, that's probably the best advice you'll get is for the thousand dollars, you'll at least know what all the ducks in a row have to be. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead, sir. Yeah, just a, a comment. Anyway, it's encouraging to know that you're moving and trying to move forward with that development so that we could see something positive and beneficial for the community. So I'm going to thank you for what you're trying to accomplish. Thank you. I appreciate that. All right, so um, are we doing uh, E or are we doing? We're doing E. e. Yep. Is E next? Yeah. Okay. So uh, development permit waterfront wall, Young Road. Who wants to take this? That's me. This is, uh, they haven't made an application yet, but they're, they're they're going to. They're interested in making an application. This is Young Road. It's a vacant property um, owned by Renco, um, and um, they have to rebuild the the front wall of the property, and it, it's failing. So they've applied for a 
a section 11 permit um, allow them to, to replace that wall. They also want to move, they also are required to move their um, dock out into, into deeper water. Um, so if you move on to the next one, Steffi, here's just a photo of the wall. If you, I actually stood at the other end of the wall and I could feel the, the rocks escaping the gabion basket somewhere. Like it's, it's not, I wouldn't want to stand there. Um, here, here's the wall that they're proposing to build. So they're proposing just a, a block wall, the railing on top. Um, I mentioned about the, the requirement for the flood wall. They said they would build this block wall higher. Um, however, they, they said they wouldn't be willing to give up the, the walkway in front. Um, if you move on to the next one. So this is a this is that study that was done by Kerwood Lydell. Um, you can see the the wall that it's it's actually serves two purposes. It's a flood wall. So it's a, a flood wall that's at the, the flood elevation. Um, and then they'd be able to put some kind of barriers where the boat launches are. So if, you know when the water comes up, it stays outside of uh, outside of the that side on, on Riverside, those properties on Riverside. Um, and it's the proposal is to go all the way across the front. So of course, cost of building that wall, you know, we're talking millions upon millions. Um, so the idea, you know, would be to, you know, you do it in phases as each person comes to develop, hopefully you get them to contribute. Um, and so this part would be, you know, most likely thing would be from um, the, like the finless inside um, across the front of reds um, right to the, the first boat launch. So that would be, you'd almost have to get commitment to do that whole section because if you just do one section in isolation, it kind of negatively affects everybody else. Um, so if you go to the next one, Steffi, you can, uh, so this is the, the section that's identified for this property. So they, they basically pile two sheets of, of steel in, and then you fill in between them and you have a walkway on top. This is, this is the plan. This is what, uh, what was put forward by the, the engineer. Um, talking to um, this is this is just kind of when you're going further down you can see how this wall has completely failed um, so this this section would need to be replaced almost at the same time as the other section I'm not sure about the engineering doing it in phases like as far as you know if you only do one section can you actually can with the other section I'm sure you can but you know you build one section up this property get totally flooded all the water that would originally go on to the vacant lot would end up on the two neighbors lots. Um, so yeah, the I and I heard there were some discussions that these properties would put the walkway along Young Road and not at the front of the property. So that's one issue is the walkway. And basically, if, and then the other issue is the flood wall. So, you know, the question is, does the district want to go, you know, full steam ahead, get this flood wall done when we have the chance to do it? If you this section's not addressed, it's kind of pointless doing it on any other. Certainly on Young Road, it's not. There's no point in doing it on the rest of Young Road. You kind of you'd be starting down there. <laughs> you build the flood wall everywhere else. I mean, Young Road's going to be under underwater, right? So, um, question I guess is who do we want to put the burden upon to build this this flood wall and uh, and what's the timing of it? Are we okay with building up Young Road and creating that as a flood barrier for the rest of the downtown? Or do we want to address it right now? Um, this, this applicant would, would build the, the sheet pile wall, provide the walkway on top, and then we capture the other properties as they come. So, go ahead. Here. Sorry, I just wanted to, to note that I did see the SRW for this property, and it does take it up to Young Road. Me. It takes the walkway up to Young Road. So it comes across the one at 1202 Young and then goes up to Young Road and along that frontage. So you want to show them on the, if you go back to that original map, you could probably show them with the pointer or point at it. Um, so this is, this is just for the concept of the walkway. Yeah. So there's, we have a dedication along here. This is that earlier application we're talking about. And then for these guys, the big chunk, you can see it on here. 
comes along here. Oh, but I see. There's a dog leg there. Hmm. Yeah, that's that's so when you when you go back to the to the original picture where you where you got um there's a there's a go back another one another one okay right there look at the black property line you got a red square there and then the black property line that's in front of the marina okay come around come back around the corner right here right there we talked about it earlier yeah. who owns that piece of dirt Say probably the province. So we have a definite issue because you have a you have a it looks like his access to his dock in front of his property is coming off of JB Marie. So this yeah, this is kind of like an orphan, doesn't appear to be part of any tenure. And so there, there's that question. The second comment is, is, is those are all commercial properties that I talked to Carol specifically when we were actually started doing this whole walkway. Carol, Todd, Waterways, all of them agreed to give up the property to put the wall in and the walkway in the front. Now, Carol, hers, I think it's a year ago now, maybe two years ago, it collapsed. It actually fell out onto the boat, she couldn't even use her own boat launch, all right? And so Gabian baskets, and I'm not 100% sure about a block wall unless it's anchored back, drilled and engineered. I, had, I haven't seen all of their drawings. No, the, the design that we spent $360,000 on is sheet piles. If they wanna go to work on it, come back with sheet piles. And they are going to give up the walkway because if our barrier needs to be on Young Road, Young Road's already getting wet. We bought bags or whatever this balloon we blow up and set along there for these high water events, and so the idea was flood mitigation. And somehow there's going to be some grant funding for flood. We have the right to protect property. So, and the right place to protect the property is on the front of it, not on the back of it. Who's going to be responsible for when they flood? And as said, if the red area puts up uh, blocks to do his, what happens to uh, Red's rentals, what happens to JB? Where's the water go? Like if you stop it, or, or does it just come around the end and go in behind anyway? So that's who owns that piece of dirt in the corner? That's problem number one. And problem number two is, is, is not a block. He's got to put in the sheet piling that we talked about. And it is a commercial property, isn't it? Yeah. Well, then he's going to give up the walkway. It, that's just. This has been in the works forever. White Pines was the first one 20 some years ago to give it up. And then it's just gone along. Three Boys Development did the same thing. They gave up the frontage for walkway. It's just, what are we putting in there? We, we, we let it start going. So now we have an issue in front of uh, Moose Mulligans. Their wall is repaired, they're falling down twice. Twice they fixed it. It's damaged the piles that support their dock. They're willing to contribute to the, like if they're willing to contribute to the portion of it based on what their cost might be, then maybe that's how we start getting grant applications by taking contributions from, because that gave me a basket wall is not there. That was never designed to last for any length of time. They're, they're a 20 to 25 year and they rot out. And they rot out on the back sides because galvanized metal was never designed to stay wet continuously. It's supposed to get wet and dry. It'll last a hundred years like a school fence. It gets wet and dry. But if you bury it in the dirt, fill it with rock, it's going to rot. And if any of them have fallen down, that's exactly what happens to them. They give out where the bottom of them is, and then everything just bails on it. So, so I know one of the like the concern of this property owner was he he saw himself giving up you know the five meters for the walkway, 
and losing that land. Um, but really, he, he can always have, he'll always own the land, but it'll be a right of way for the walkway. Um, but then it's the, you know, the cost between, you know, the sheet pile and the block wall. That's, that's probably a second concern. Well, like, that's why I said if they're, if, uh, and like I said, I know that they, they would give up the walkway because we talked to Carolina, talked to Todd on his property on Martin Street. That they, they were all willing to give it up to see this vision happen, but geez, it took two years for Kerwood Liddell to spend that 300 grand and come back with something. And, and by then we're, we're now focused on other stuff, but this is a key to connectivity in our community. And it was always supposed to be a waterfront walkway. It's been like that since before I ever got here, like a long time. So go ahead, Brian. Yeah, this, this is definitely putting the community ahead of um, a few concerns. This is extremely important. The OCP um, connectivity and walkability in the OCP is, is top of the list. Um, you know, that that needs to be sheet piled. I totally agree. Um, there's going to, you know, bank omelets, you got to crack some eggs and and uh, you know, I know the people that own this property, and and I would definitely, uh, you know, I'd say that to you know to them in person as well. This is a, this is the way it should be should be done. So I totally agree. With Jeff. But uh, yeah, I I agree too. Obviously, we were all in the OCP and and connectivity and access to people of Sycamus to the waterfront. It's you know, it's huge. You can't. <laughs> It's huge, but I, you know, like I always look at things as opportunities and it seems to me, we've got a whole lot of failing walls here, which is an opportunity to really kick some butt here in terms of getting these walls replaced with what we're looking for. It's not like we've got, you know, one's just perfect and, and you know, like they're, they're all failing. It's, it's time we have a chat with these guys and get this going. And you, you know, I've never done sheet piling before, but I don't imagine you do it in small spaces. You do cut off big chunks and do the project and then move along. Well, sheet piling comes in usually in 18 inch or two foot wide widths. And so uh, your, your, uh, your opportunity is to go from the Capel Street boat launch and come around there because now you're secure. You gotta, you gotta secure the water just can't come around behind it. You have to secure it, run it along. And so it would make sense to go, because we looked at doing from Capel. I'm not sure how far we were going with, 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 with the start of it of $700,000 they had budgeted. And Joe was trying to get 75,000, whether that just did the front of three boys or whether how far it got. But this would be a good opportunity. Carol's, uh, that, that marina, their, their wall has failed and she needs to do something. The, uh, and she has a, a boat launch there already. So even if you just went from her boat launch around and up to the end of Finlayson, that's a doable thing. Now, they, their wall's failing, so they want to contribute. So we, we, I personally have had this conversation with some of them already. So I don't know whether it's the planning and development committee, whether we want to go have this conversation with those individuals to see, because they're going to contribute to replacing their wall. If they contribute to that, can we top it up to do what we actually talked about doing? Um, but this particular property, that piece of dirt that is owned by nobody, we need to find out what that is. And I, I, I know that staff, you have access to land titles of that. I, I'm not going to pay $300 to find out who owns that piece of dirt. But we need to find out who owns that piece of dirt. Because his access to the dock in front of his property appears to be coming from J.B. Marine. Or not J.B. Marine, the, the marina. So and I don't know how that worked out. Um, <laughs> but the pathway was always to be on the channel. Yeah, that's a message we'll send back and go from there, yeah. And, 
And if you like, if 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 it needs to go up to council to have the planning and development committee will visit the people between uh, uh, Main Street Landing and and Finlayson and have a conversation with them about contributing to the a rebuild, but a rebuild that will be done right. Because it doesn't matter those blocks, he's still going to have to dig into that property to put anchors back there because he's over two blocks high. And it, you got to do the same thing when you put in sheet piling. You're going to have to put in tie back anchoring off of it as well. Yeah, so, and our idea about that sheet piling was is that if you did the sheet piling, you could actually cantilever the walkway over top of it. You could make it a 50 50 deal so they weren't losing so much property. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, I think we'll start with this this property owner, and then we'll, um, and then yeah, kind of look at the bigger picture, and yeah, maybe yeah, that's just it. Invite these other owners to be involved in the the conversation. Well, we should maybe arrange for to have a meeting in the planning committee and go through. Would you be willing to do this? Go ahead, Sarah. Just to answer your question about that piece of dirt, there is a there is a, a license or a tenure on there so we can look into it and see if it's related to the one in front so that pink area that you got there that is a somebody has an agreement with the province here right? somebody has. where that where that access is yeah somebody's got something there so it must be tied it may very well be connected to this one i don't know and and how 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 do you get that not being the upfront landowner? It's a different mapping system with the Ministry of Environment, I think. So there's hope for us. I've added to Lightship so we can see where these are. Um, but to learn more details and look at a copy of the license, we'd have to access it through a, a different portal, a different map portal. Well, it'd be, it'd be very interesting because maybe we could apply it to the rail trip. Just thought I'd throw that. <laughs> I hope somebody's listening. So yes, if you if you want to go back to them and they would like to come to the, but if they would like to come to the planning committee, I would strongly suggest that we get Carol and Mike from Rents Rentals or some representative so that we can have a conversation about the entire because we're looking at doing the boat launch we started on it yeah uh, i don't know what's happening with red's rentals boat launch exactly so we could fix a whole lot of things and if we if we had a contribution if they're willing to put in that block wall i can't imagine that that block wall's inexpensive it may be less than sheet piling yes, yeah. but not not a lot. Yeah. Yeah. It's still, it's still not cost there. Yeah. So maybe we can work with them to and Carol to put together something where we can apply for a grant to actually do this and everybody wins. Yeah. If that's acceptable. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So next on the agenda. Revitalization. Okay. Next your addition yeah i don't even remember what it was revitalization tax oh the revitalization tax yeah the the reason that i asked about the uh, revitalization tax is because it's a it's a conversation that's happening in the finance okay and and uh, the ocp led to when we first got elected seven years ago to need to do something to attract to the downtown core. So as the planning and development committee, um, there's it's carved into different zones. Right now, it's basically carved black over the whole community. Uh, just about every piece of property qualifies for in some form, housing, this, that, you know, it, it's, and, so I just wanted to make the planning and development committee aware that uh, the OCP and development and this revitalization tax 
uh, and the revitalization tax has costed us about $40,000 in law annually, which is a 1% remedy. So there's consideration to uh, changing that, amending it. I suggested through DCCs because developers would prefer the money up front than at the back end and, and, and recover it there. Mm -hmm. and, and the reason for mentioning it is because it's a part of our zoning bylaws. It depends on where you are as to who qualifies for it. So I just wanted you to be aware that, you know, it's a consideration. It costs the community. Uh, is there a better way to do it? And end up with the same thing that the developers end up with a bit of a slice of a pie because they can pay. I'm not 100% familiar, Scott. I don't know if you can. Uh, they could pay the DCCs over three years. Right. So you, yeah, you can you can defer DCCs over three three years. Yeah. So if you owe a hundred thousand dollars in DCCs, you pay thirty three thousand. One year, one year later, thirty-three thousand, and then a third year, thirty-three thousand. Yeah. And now, is that over three years, or is that got to be paid upon completion of the development? <clears throat> it you have to you'd have to provide a letter of credit at the time your subdivision is approved, or um, or maybe perhaps your building permit's approved. So you have to pay that first third, and then letter of credit for the second two thirds. And so if you finish the development in two years, you still wouldn't pay your last third till year three. Right. Is that correct? Yeah. Tied to completion of or final sale of development at all. Right. Okay. But like I said, I just wanted to bring that forward because it, it's we have to find a better way because there's some development that's gonna happen. And if we're already through four or five of them at, at 1%, if we get a couple more going on, we could end up that it, it's costing two, three, four percent out of our out of the tax revenue, and we still have to operate. So mm -hmm. that leads to the idea about Airbnb, which is in the zoning. Do you want to? So we only have seven minutes, Sarah. Do you want to just? maybe move forward to the Airbnb um, or the short-term rental? Try. Oh, yes, this works much better. Oops. <clears throat> okay, I don't know that we need to look at the timeline if we're in a hurry. Uh, so the zoning bylaw, this has all been built into it. So short-term rentals, this is our definition, uh, means the renting of a principal dwelling unit in a residential zone for a period of less than 30 days uh, and does not include accommodation in a recreational vehicle or a tent. Can we just back up? Yeah. Um, so principal dwelling at a unit resident for a period of less than 30 days. I'm not sure that that's going to be enough. Any thoughts? Why not? Um, generally, the generally like <clears throat> commercial accommodation is thirty days or less. So thirty days or less, you're it's a motel, right? So probably you know that's where you come up with thirty days. Hopefully, someone's you know you can see two months could be a. You know, if someone was renting a place in Sycamore, you'd see them like two months would be reasonable for a short-term rental. But um, yeah, we, we came up with 30 days. Okay, so I, I, I immediately am going, I can find a way around this. I own 10 condos of waterfront and, and I, I just sublease them to myself at a different company. And then I go back to my Airbnb. You're not going to make it completely bulletproof for everything. Yeah. Sometimes it's close enough. So, sorry, I, I, that's just my comment is I don't think that 30 days is going to sufficient because 
they kick you out before the May long weekend and they let you back in after the September long weekend. We're talking about seasonal. Your concern is with seasonal. And that's what makes it that we don't have any year-round accommodations. We Right now, we have 85% of the condos on the channel are empty. That's Kevin. He lives in one. He's yeah. got no neighbors. What were you saying again? It was to May, something to May? From from just prior to the May long weekend through to probably through to the end of September. So if you want a rent a place, you can rent a place. And, and even Evan has to vacate where he's at because they're renting out in the summertime. Now, I could create my own contract where I'm going, I'm renting that for the four months and, and then I beat your bylaw and then still go back to doing what I'm doing. So hopefully somewhere in the next line, if it's found or they're due, like, because that's how you would get around that. But the idea was to make them pay the same tax as hotels. Mm -hmm. Maybe we need to add an additional layer, 30 days or less for under six months a year or more, eight months a year. Yeah. In terms of seasonality. Okay, I'll, I'll tweak it, Scott. Um, so the next slide, we have our general regulations for it, the parts that fit in the zoning bylaw. Right. Um, so we do have updated copies of the zoning bylaw we can give you all. Um, so that you can see this up close. <laughs> I think you're pretty familiar with a lot of these. So we're permitted by this, by this bylaw. Short term rental shall be subject to the following conditions. Uh, so basically, this says you have to have a business license, A. Uh, B, you have to meet the minimum parking requirements. C, you have to have a local responsible person designated. And the authority to make decisions with regards to the property. Uh, the at contact information for that local responsible person has to be prominently displayed within the short term rental name and phone number. And the local person has to be able to respond in two hours. Uh, some of the feedback was what about one hour? So this is something I've left and read in the bylaw because we haven't talked about it in the last few meetings. And then this is a newer addition that uh, the unit has to be serviced, have its own separate metered service for community water and sewer. Uh, next slide, Steffi. So currently the term short-term rental or similar, there's, a, there's three different kind of formats permitted in, in these zones. So the C4 tourist potential resort zone, which is what we've applied all along the side on the water channel side. The RDP zone, which I, as an accessory use, which I see as a little bit of an issue because our definition says that it can't be an RDs. So it doesn't quite work. We're gonna have to tweak that. A1 as an accessory use, and that perhaps we could tweak as well and just make it a bed and breakfast. Uh, and CR. It's currently as an accessory use, but I, I would see that which should be a principal use because short term rental in its definition is a principal use. Uh, in residential zones, it's kind of designed to mitigate impacts in neighborhoods where you can have it as a bed and breakfast. And a bed and breakfast is permitted now in the draft bylaw uh, as a secondary in a secondary dwelling. So it can be a storage house, garden cottage, or a suite that's part of a house. And currently, a secondary suite the, the, in the bylaw is detached by a breezeway. It has a, a maximum separation distance. I think it's like what is it, six meters or four meters, two meters? So you have to have a roof connecting them and shared foundation. So there's some space. So then aside from that, the way the term was designed is that we would look at adding it as a site-specific regulation where people came forward and asked, like, I would like to have this use recognized on my residential property. And then we would add it as a site-specific regulation subject to public hearing. So we try to capture that all in, in one, one process, right? In terms of whether or not the community supported, supported that particular property. And so far, no one has asked. 
to be recognized. Like we know there are houses out there, but nobody's asked. So. Okay, so the single biggest concern and what was discussed about a couple of meetings ago, and I think it even was discussed at council, was the idea that we had to level the playing field, which meant that the people who wanted Airbnb and short-term rental, that their property was subject to the same taxation rate as the hotels are paying. And I don't see that in here. Yeah, so that would come, so next steps. Um, so because the zoning bylaw has to go to several readings, public hearing, uh, there's limitations on when it can be adopted, right? We have to have MLTI sign off. So the, there are some other bylaws that components would be implemented through uh, that we bring forward at around third reading of the zoning bylaw. And that would be some amendments to the business license bylaw uh, to add new license types to it. Um, we would also amend the fees by law to add additional fees. License will be a separate fee for term rentals. Uh, potentially, we would add a, a new fee for building inspection because there would be also a requirement to have an inspection in order to get your business license. So that would be some of the changes to business license as well. As well, under that new license type, is in order to get this, you have to have a safety health and safety inspection through the, by the building inspector, right? Um, and then servicing fees, we would relook at that because the idea would be that they would be paying commercial rates for water and sewer instead of residential rates. And then as far as taxation goes, BC assessment would catch up, right? And that would change, they'd be assessed differently. So currently, uh, I'm just going to comment about this just for a second. Currently, like the condos. They got a three inch meter coming in and, and, and there's no individual meters in anybody's apartment. So what we're saying is, is that if you have an apartment that you want to Airbnb out, that you're going to have to put in your own water meter in that apartment. And that would be part of looking at the ser servicing fees. So I think what it comes down to already, like part of the business licensing where you're in a strata, you have to have a letter from the strata saying that you can do it, right? Because they, they have kind of final say as to whether or not they want them in their building, right? But yeah, that's a good point. How do we deal with servicing when you've got multiple units, some are residential and some are commercial? So somehow we have to make it a level playing field because that's what we were going to level these Airbnbs out with the hotels. So they should pay the same tax, they should pay the same commercial rate, they should pay, they should pay. Go ahead, Brian, sorry. No, that's okay. I, I just, uh, the, what I was thinking of is you in the slide uh, one back or two back, you talked about uh, servicing um, so water and sewer into its secondary suite on the same property. Um, I'll just give you a quick clarification. So those stratas, their use is tourist accommodation right? Not short-term rental. So this section of the general regulations would not apply to the strata. Uh, In no, terms of leveling the playing field. I'm talking to residential. Yeah. Okay. So to a and the dwelling unit, like the tree streets. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, so you, you stipulate that you need um, water and sewer into that individual unit. So uh, right now, <laughs> the situation you would run your water, you would run your sewer and then why into the, the main residence's connection? If it was a long-term rental secondary suite, yes. Okay. But if they're going to do short-term rental. Okay, that's good clarification. Yeah. And then the other thing is leasing. Um, so if you're, if I'm in a residential area and I live beside somebody and I suggest, and I suspect that they have a Airbnb and I would call the district of Sigmus and then they would send a uh, bylaw officer around to check it out. And then, and then that would be the go person. from there. Yeah. Go from there. Yeah. So that's the, that's the policing. Yeah. Method. yeah. Or is there any teeth to it as far as, um, you know, assessing uh, on, on their taxes? Is there anything that um, I'm just thinking, you know, that so many people are going to try and dodge this, that, 
Like how how will it work? Where's the where's the teeth of this? So we will be reliant for the most part on reporting. Um, in terms of because this does tie in with our housing needs, right? <laughs> Um, we're digging into what we can find as far as tax roll. It doesn't give us specifics. It doesn't tell us how a property is being used, right? right? All we can suss out is, is it owned locally or not? And does the owner live there? Right. So all that's going to do is tell us they, they might be renting it out long-term. They might be renting it out seasonally, or they might be not at all. And it's their second home and it's just them and their family and friends that are there seasonally. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yes. But it does still kind of show us where our housing gap might exist. Right. Yeah. Right. But we don't know for sure. So just like with all bylaws, it requires people to report it unless council is actively asking us to be going through ads and looking, ferreting these things out. I mean, that's council's decision. Depends on what kind of a line council wants to take. Go ahead, Scott. <clears throat> Probably should look to adjourn the meeting because the other meeting starts in four minutes. Yeah, no, I'm, I, I'm already full. Oh, I got to bring the gavel down this half day because this is a discussion that needs to happen. Actually, more with council as well, so that council can give direction to staff about how we're going to deal with this Airbnb. Um, we made a commitment to the hoteliers to get the MRDP in place, which we have in place. And we need to complete the process because they signed up because we were going to deal with Airbnb. And so however we're going to deal with it, it needs to happen sooner than later. So, all right, motion to adjourn the uh, Planning Development Committee at 2.57. <laughs> First and second, all in favor? Yes, okay, thank you. So, get out of your chair, Your Worship. Did a good job.